there was a girl. She was five years old. She had blonde curly hair and red shiny shoes, and she loved Disney and going to the park. And um, one particular night, this little girl's life changed in an instant when her mum was in a car on the way to work, and there was ice on the floor, ice on the road. And the, the car skidded on the ice. It flipped over three times and smashed into a tree, and she was left in there for four hours as cars drove backwards and forwards thinking that's just what it was, a wreck. Until a taxi driver had a sense that he should stop. He stopped the car, got outside, went over to the car wreck and looked inside and saw this little girl's mum in a really bad way. She was airlifted by air ambulance to the local hospital and rushed, rushed straight into surgery. On that particular day, that little girl with blonde curly hair and red shiny shoes, hopelessness and trauma set in as it appeared and was realized when she got into surgery that the break was worse than the doctors actually thought. She'd broken her neck. It was called the hangman's fracture. You can imagine why. And she went into surgery and the doctors thinking that it was gonna last kind of four to six hours. It lasted twice that. And thankfully, some miraculous way, this little girl's mum who they thought maybe paralyzed from the neck down, the waist down, or maybe even worse, that it would be fatal. She walked out of that hospital around six weeks later. But you see, in that little girl's life, that little girl with blonde curly hair and red shiny shoes, trauma had set in so deeply that she was fearful every time her, presence, her, her parents wouldn't be in her presence that something awful was gonna happen. She was in a heightened state of anxiety and alert. Skip forward three years, this little girl with blonde curly hair and red shiny shoes, she's grown up in a church, not too dissimilar to this one, and she's heard all the stories that there ever were to, to hear. She, she, knows, she knows the key verses, you know, that often on the, the magnets are on your fridge. And, and this particular night, this little girl, the age of eight years old, blonde curly hair, red shiny shoes, she's invited to an event a little bit like this. Well, there's a band a little bit like the one that we've just heard, a phenomenal band that are singing songs to Jesus. And then she hears somebody, a little bit like me, step foot on a stage a little bit like this one and talk to her about a God that so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And she was told of a God that sent his only son to live a life that we couldn't live, a perfect one, but die a death that we deserved to die. And that night, that little girl, blonde curly hair and red shiny shoes, she ran home. She ran up the stairs, she went into her bedrooms and her bedroom and she, she opened the curtains and she looked up into the night sky. And she looked at all the stars and she thought this, maybe just maybe there's a God. Maybe just maybe he loves me. Maybe just maybe he wants to have a relationship with me. And so that night that little girl made a decision that she's never ever regretted since. And she welcomed God into her life. That little girl was me. And you know what? My life has never been the same since. Because I was a broken, fragile little girl who was so lost, so scared, so fearful of life, so anxious. And then I met Hope himself. And I believe that Hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. And he set me free. And he brought hope to a hopeless little girl. And he brought freedom where I felt captive. And I felt bound by chains of fear. And you see, ever since that point, I haven't been able to stop talking about Jesus. I can't shut up about him. Wherever I go, my parents used to laugh about it because they couldn't take me anywhere, take me to a petrol station or, or a dance class or a bus stop. I just tell people about Jesus because he's that good. You see, I love Christmas time, do you? Anyone love Christmas? I love the Christmas lights. I love the Christmas trees. I love getting the house just really decorative. I, I just love it. I love all the Christmas films. I think I've watched about 10 Netflix cheesy as can be Christmas films so, so far. Anyone else? Yeah? I felt, I felt you there. You were with me. Um, I love Christmas. And my little girl, um, I think she might be at the back still. 
she just loves all the Christmas songs now. She's just turned two. She's called Bonnie Ray. And uh, me and my husband and Bonnie Ray, we travel around together wherever we go, whenever I speak around the, around the UK mostly. And we're like a package deal. But she just loves Christmas songs, man. Her favorite is Jingle Bells and We Wish You Merry Christmas. I've heard it a lot, you know. I'm even going for harmonies now just to feel like we've got a different arrangement coming in. But um, I love Christmas. And like the song said, it's, it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? Or maybe not for everybody. Maybe for you, actually, it isn't the most wonderful time of year. Maybe actually this year, Christmas is surrounded by loads of pain. Maybe there's been loss in your family or your friendship group this year that you just don't understand. Maybe there should be somebody around your dinner table this Christmas that won't be. Maybe it's not the most wonderful time of the year because of the crisis that we're living in. I know us as a family, we've got to do Christmas differently this year, as have so many countless other people. Maybe it doesn't feel like the most wonderful time of the year. But often I think at Christmas time, we get so focused on the lights and the Christmas trees and the presents that we exchange, we forget the real point. It's just somewhere off to the side. And it's the nativity story. Now, you can't really get through the Christmas season without hearing about it, right? About hearing about Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus and the wise men and the shepherds. Whether you hear it in a song or you watch it in a film or you see it on a Christmas card or you see it on a bauble, you can't escape it. Whether it's a song lyric that you hear, at this time of year, you can't escape it. But somehow, often, the nativity story is explained almost like a fairy tale. But I want to tell you guys tonight that it's actually far from a fairy tale. In Luke, in the Bible, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're called the Gospels. You've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the New Testament begins with Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And in Luke, there's a really detailed description of, of, of the beginning of Jesus' life of the story of the nativity story of Mary and Joseph and, and the wise men and the, and the shepherds. Luke is a detailed writer. He writes in real detail. But I'm just going to give you an overview tonight, but I, I want to highlight some things that, that might challenge the, the perception that the nativity story was just all warm and cozy and fuzzy and a little bit like a fairy tale, because what I read is it's quite far from it. You see, we've got Mary. She's just an ordinary girl in a small town. She's engaged to be married to Joseph. And listen, Joseph is a bit of a big name. He's in the line of David. He's, 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 he's a good name. He's a good family that she's going to be kind of married into. She's done well. And so here is this Mary, this ordinary girl. We know that she's probably to mid to late teens. And she's, she's engaged to be married to Joseph. And she's just going through her ordinary day. We don't know whether it's night or day, but she has an angelic visitation. Isn't it so often that God just comes in the ordinary, everyday moments? And here she has an angelic visitation from the angel Gabriel who tells her that she is going to be pregnant. She's going to carry the king of the world. Can you imagine for a moment what that was like? You see, if I was told that, if I had an angelic visitation, I was told that, I think maybe I'd have a few questions. But what we see from Mary's response is she's like, I'm down. Let it be, as you said, I'm down. And yet then we meet, we meet Joseph, the, the, the guy that she's betrothed to marry, the, the guy that she's engaged to. And I, I want you to think about the conversation that they have just, just for a minute. Here is Mary engaged to be married to Joseph so that they're not living together, they're not married yet. And, and she goes up to Joseph. I wonder what was going through her brain on the walk over there. And she gets to Joseph and she says, Joseph, um, angel Gabriel appeared to me. I mean, what would you be thinking? Do you know what I mean? Has Mary lost her mind? Woohoo! Like, what's going on? And here, Mary then tells exactly what's happened to Joseph. And, and fair enough, Joseph is like, I'm out. <laughs> like, I, I'm out. You're telling me that you're pregnant with the king of the universe, and this is God's doing. Like, he's like, I'm out of here. It says that he's kind of planning to kind of cut off the engagement. And why wouldn't you, right? Until he has an angelic visitation himself. He has a dream. And the angel comes to him, and he says, listen, Mary's right. She's heard right. Don't, 
Don't end this engagement. Marry Mary. This is the thing that God is calling you both to do, to raise Jesus. And so here is Joseph, convinced after that moment, convinced after that encounter that this is what he's called to do. But tonight, guys, I want to talk to you a little bit about the fact that when God calls us, as he does, there's a cost. And there was a cost for Mary and Joseph. Don't don't you think in your mind, oh, yeah, nice, happy, happy as Larry. Now the angels come, they're together, they're going to get married, bring in the donkey, bring in the wise men, bring in the shepherds, let's go. It wasn't like that. There would have been loads of speculation around their marriage. There'd been a lot of gossip. It's a small town. News travels fast. Have you heard that Mary's pregnant? She's saying it's not Joseph's. She's saying, God, God has given her this baby. Can you imagine what they would have had to go through, probably walking down streets as people gossip and talk and speculate about them as a couple? What their friends would have said, what even their families would have said, but they had a conviction so strong that God had called them that I believe that even in the doubts, even in the moments where they felt really isolated, I imagine, and and lonely and had big questions, they knew this conviction deep within them that God had called them to do this. And so as we know, as the story unravels, they travel to Bethlehem. And there's no room at any inn. It's packed out because there's a census going on. and There's nowhere to go. You know, this one innkeeper's like, hey, we've got no room, but listen, there's, like, there's a shack out back and there's, a, there's some hay. We could get it a bit more comfortable for you. And here brings... Here, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus into the world. You see, the call was great on their lives, but the cost was also great. But I believe at every moment of the cost on their journey, that continued. So as they looked down at this little life, I wonder if they thought he's worth it. Every time he's worth it. He is worth it. And I just want to talk to you guys for another five, ten minutes or so just about the cost of following Jesus. Because, you know, normally I, I, I write my talks out, like, pretty scripted, and I kind of try and learn them, and then I share it with you. But today I really felt like God said, get up there with with no notes, with no quite real idea of what you're going to say, and just let me speak. And when I say God speaks to me, I heard someone once say it was, it's almost like a quiver in your liver. It's just something that you can't really shake. It's like a thought on your mind that's on repeat. That's what I felt today when I was planning and driving here. I thought, I don't think I'm going to get up with any notes tonight. I'm just going to see what the Lord wants to say. And I believe he wants to talk to us about the cost of following him tonight. That the cost is great, but it's worth it. So I want to take you back to last year. My life looked really, really, really different to now. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Are you guys good? Good. Let me tell you a bit about it. So I basically um, had worked for a youth organization for 10 years. Uh, I was an evangelist, which basically means uh, I I travel around telling people about Jesus. I've done it since I was eight. I didn't know you could get a job in it. Um, And then I did. I mean, the money wasn't great, but uh, uh, that's what you get for working for a Christian charity. But it was worth it nonetheless. I I travel around and and I used dance for the first few years to kind of connect with, uh, with young people particularly and then share my faith off the back of it. And then for the last few years, that's what I've been doing. And then... um, I guess COVID hit, and and for everybody, COVID, right, it just looked really different. Um, But it was a real time for me of just pausing and of just, like, thinking back over my life and thinking about my faith and thinking about what my faith really looked like. And 
And my life was pretty comfy. Um, I, I had like a four bed, we, me and my husband had a four bed detached house. We'd completely renovated it. It was beautiful. I mean, like it even had a hot water tap. You know, like that instant, oh yeah, 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 it was nice. Um, we had a drive on, drive off drive, and we overlooked a wood. I mean, we were kind of set. And there was a beautiful little school down the road that our little girl was, you know, we were thinking, oh, she can go there. And our family and friends, they, they all lived kind of five, ten minutes away. We were part of an amazing church in Birmingham that we'd been part of for years. And we just loved it. Life was good, it was sweet, it was comfortable, and it was safe. My husband was a plumber, had been for ten years, and he was bringing in money. We were good. And then I began to read about what it means to be a true disciple. And I was starting to read verses. I'm going to sit down. Do you mind that? I never do this. But I'm going to do it. <laughs> I began to read some verses in the Gospels about what it means to be a true disciple. And I started to see that it actually cost them. It cost them often their livelihoods, cost them friendships, sometimes family. Often it, it cost them their lives. And I began to think, I, I don't want to get to the end of my life and think that I went to church on a Sunday, I gave a bit of my money away and I tried not to swear. Like, I don't think that's why Jesus died. I don't feel like that's why Jesus came. And all I could see is this comfortable Christianity that I had where everything was safe. And I, I, I felt like God was inviting me to, to live a life of cost and sacrifice. And as I read in, in Matthew 16, Jesus talks to his disciples and he says this, then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the only way. My way to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? And what could you ever trade your soul for? And I'm thinking, what does it cost me to follow Jesus? Really? And so I began praying, and man, if you pray for dangerous prayers, expect dangerous answers. Because we felt God say to us, are you prepared to lay it all down? And I'd love to say that my answer was just yes straight away and I went on my knees, but I didn't. I was like, my hot water tap. <laughs> no. My nice drive on, drive off drive, my nice cars, I don't, I don't know. And it was a process. But ultimately the question was this, is it worth it? And just like I believe when Joseph and Mary Look to the face of Jesus. And they could have looked to their surroundings. They could have looked to the situations that they were in. The difficulty that they were in. But instead they focused on him. And I wonder, as they focused on him, in the same way that I did in that moment, said he's worth it. Every single time. Because if he gave everything for me, I want to give everything for him. So we put our house on the market last April. No idea where we were really going to go, but expecting that it was going to be local still. Do you know what I mean? I had childcare on tap. Why would I move away? And then um, we got to August, and our, our house had gone through a couple of times and, and then collapsed sales, and it was a nightmare. And I prayed. I was like, God, would you just, would you just show me when the right people 
are going to buy a house. And I believe God gave me a figure. Just in my mind, it was just like a thought on repeat. And I wrote this figure down. It was not the figure that our house was on the market for. Anyway, in August uh, 19th, our house had been on the, the market for like three months, three, four months. I had a, we had like a relatively small baby. Bonnie Ray was small at the time. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I want to stay in my nice house. Maybe God isn't speaking. Maybe this isn't it. And then we just had this crazy moment in that kitchen where I just said, Nathan, you need to pray. And he's like, I don't want to pray. Ever had those moments? He's like, I don't want to pray. I don't know what to pray. I was like, imagine Jesus is standing in front of you. What would you say to him? And this raw prayer came out, which was a little bit like this. I dare you. I dare you to move, God. I dare you to sell a house in the next 24 hours at the figure that you've given grace. 17 hours later, a couple come around our house. They sit in our lounge and say, normally we go to the estate agents, but we're not going to do that. We want to give you this. And it was exactly the figure that I'd written out. So I said, it's yours. Even the whole water tap, even the drive on, drive off, drive, it's yours. Two days later, we go to Cornwall on a holiday or so, we thought. The second day that we're here, second day we're in Cornwall, we drive over a bridge into a town called Waybridge, and I pray another dangerous prayer. I pray this, God, we'll go wherever you want us to go, we'll do whatever you want us to do. <laughs> Within a half an hour radius, you know. We'll go wherever you want us to go and do whatever you want us to do, as long as I'm near my family. <laughs> And then we meet this woman who who I know pretty well called Sarah Yardley. You might know her too. Were you banking on that? Okay. Bingo. And uh, she runs something called Creation Fest. She's a good friend of mine. She was walking down the high street. And uh, we go for a coffee with her. She starts to talk to us about the Southwest and the need here. And me and my husband's hearts break. And as we walk out of that coffee shop, we turn to each other and say, is it here? Do you think it's here? And three months later, in December, a year to the day, today, we had sold our house, put all of our stuff into storage, got two suitcases, two boxes of toys, said goodbye to all of our family, all of our friends, all of our church family. We bought a camper van at this point. I was thinking I'm in a midlife crisis. And we pack the van with Bonnie, our one-year-old, and our little dog, Bailey. And, we, and we, we drive from Birmingham to Cornwall, not having any idea why or what for or what the year is going to look like ahead. And it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Cornwall's beautiful but there's a lot of brokenness there. It's beautiful, but it's also bleak. And so this year, my year hasn't looked like I thought it was going to look. I thought, oh, I'll lay all that down, then I'll get a nice house, and I'll get my nice cars back, and I'll know exactly what's going to happen from one day to the next, and we'll both get some, you know, we'll both get jobs, and it'll all be really comfortable again. We had no home for nine months. Some nights I didn't even know where I was going to put Bonnie to sleep that night. But I'm here to tell you that it's worth it. Because you see, I've never seen provision like that in my whole entire life. I've never ever seen God move in the way that he's moved this year. I've never seen miraculous amounts of money appear in our bank account. I've never met more generous people that God has used to bless us. I've never seen miracles in front of my eyes the way that I am now. And the only difference, I believe, is that I'm just done with the safe. I'm tired of the comfortable Christianity. I don't want to just go to church on a Sunday and give a bit of my money away and try not to swear. I want my life to actually live. I want to live a life that only makes sense because he's alive. And he is who he says he is. I want to live a life of true discipleship. And ultimately, Mary and Joseph trusted God. And if you trust him, truly, you will obey.
When God calls us, there is a cost. But it's always worth it. And we never have to do it alone. Firstly, because you've got one another. Just look around the room. We're not called to do this on our own. But also, because we have the Holy Spirit. 